this is Michael Roy, uh, and I am a Senior Vice President at Argo. Uh, Argo provides uh, uh, business process solutions and innovation uh, out to multiple clients. And as we focus in the healthcare space here, this includes payers, providers, uh, and some of the, uh, the newest innovations that are coming in the healthcare space uh, being good partners. Uh, but as we brought together a panel today for us in our, in our uh, segment two of a series of three in webinars, uh, yeah, we're pleased to have a, a great panel here with us. Uh, along with me is, is our co-host, uh, Louis Nico. Louis is president of the healthcare division of Skycom. Uh, and uh, Lewis comes from a background uh, from uh, going back to Accenture Healthcare and others and bringing some of that uh, leading thought leadership uh, in the healthcare space, uh, especially when it comes to uh, customer experience. Um, as we introduce the, uh, the good panel that we have here today and a couple of key questions that we wanna focus on, uh, our core objective here is really just for us to be able to bring together some thought leadership uh, some looks in arrears at 2020 and the challenges that all of us, frankly, had to experience in the course of uh, making business work, caring for our employees, caring for our customers, patients, members uh, in the course of things, uh, and being able to provide you know, a, a quality of service uh, back despite uh, pandemic challenges, uh, moving into work at home, moving into all kinds of other things and uh, frankly, a higher demand in the healthcare space at the same time. So lots of great challenges uh, that were there. Uh, I think the panel here that we brought together is excellent, being able to share uh, those challenges, uh, some of the opportunities, some of the learnings, some, you know, frankly, even some of the failures and what had to be recovered from uh, are just as important uh, in what we gleaned from last year. And then the second question that we address is really gonna be looking ahead into 2021 and uh, what are some of those key learnings that are being applied here uh, and, and frankly innovating the business as we go forward. Uh, so this will have a bit more of a technology spin as we look across people, process and technology uh, in the healthcare space and how we improve that patient experience. Uh, so that technology focus will be an aspect that we have here today. Um, that said, I'd like to introduce uh, our good panel that we've got. Uh, and that includes, and, and I'll, I'll start with ladies first. So we've got Ruth O'Brien and uh, Ruth is the principal consultant, uh, particularly around uh, a focus of customer experience uh, for NTT, a, a large global provider of solutions. And we're pleased to have Ruth with us. Um, additionally, we've got Yossi Abraham, who is president of Zappix. Uh, Yossi provides some of, some of the greatest innovations that we're seeing coming out from applications uh, that can help from self-service uh, to other great ways of, of providing omni-channel experience, uh, being able to meet your patients when, where, and how they want to be met. Uh, further, we've got uh, Mike Puccinelli. Uh, Mike is the CEO of Singlecom. Singlecom is uh, one of the great innovative platforms uh, for telephony, omni-channel, uh, being able to manage good workflows, uh, scripting, et cetera. Uh, out there and uh, is, is near and dear to the Argo and, uh, and Skycom hearts, you know, as, as a core provider and platform that we utilize today in the healthcare space. Uh, and lastly is Charlie Caperton. Uh, Charlie is the Solutions and Business Development VP at Talon. Again, a specialized platform that is bringing great innovation and solutions uh, for healthcare providers uh, in the marketplace today. Uh, and uh, I did say lastly, but we've got our own Brandon Bedeen, who is our, our head uh, of technology and our, our chief information services officer uh, that we have, uh, keeping us all compliant and operational uh, here at Argo and Skycom. So glad to have everyone on the panel today. Good. And, and that said, we will, uh, we will you know, not have any further ado. We'll dive right into you know, the initial question. And Lewis uh, will be facilitating questions for us today. So Lewis, we'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for that. So um, the first question that I have for the panel is um, from a technology perspective, what are some of the customer service challenges, failures, successes, and then some learnings from 2020 that you can provide to, to everyone? 
And then the first uh, person I'd like to um, uh, point the question to is Yossi. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question and thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, so I think the pandemic really put a spotlight on, on inefficient practices and outdated technology for several healthcare providers and uh, really emphasize the need of having technology almost as a necessity in today's uh, time and, and really allowing the patients to uh, to have that ease of use, digital engagement, and, and so on. And, and not everybody had it. And it, there were some really towering challenges for a lot of those healthcare providers. First of all, they had to handle, from the healthcare's perspective, they had to handle the pandemic and the cases and so on. Second of all, they had to shift a lot of the changes to work from, from the practice, from the hospital, to move to Tele telemedicine to move uh, to work from home for a lot of uh, those providers, and and I remember even you know some of the uh, doctors that we work with, they were talking for years about oh we need to start to introduce video uh, video uh, calls and uh, video appointments and suddenly they had to do it mm -hmm. overnight, so and not everybody was ready for that. So I think the challenges were really some technological, some process oriented, and, and the fact that they had no time to prepare for it and they had to be really uh, to handle that very, very quickly. And on the other hand, what 2020 has proved to us is really the acceleration of, of life, I would call it, the, the acceleration of digital transformation. We have seen it in our, for our healthcare customers, we have seen it across the board. And I think, that what we have seen is that those companies that had agility, that had the change management mindset, that had the technology in place, maybe not the full technology stack, but had the openness to add layers of technology, they were the ones that were able to adjust as quickly as possible to that uh, to the current situation. Very good, thank you, Yossi. And um, I'd like to also um, pose the same question to Ruth. Ruth, if you can uh, give us your thoughts. Thanks. You cannot talk about 2020 without talking about the impact that the pandemic had. So building on what Yossi was talking about, one of the things we saw was the rapid move to remote workers, people working at home where they weren't doing that before. And we proved um, that we're able to not only work at home, but teach our kids at home, right? Get our telemedicine, interact with our, our healthcare providers, et cetera. And I think what I would say is really both a learning and a success was just the absolute heroic effort that I saw IT leaders and business people participate in to get those folks at home. We had clients that moved over 300 people home in less than a week because they had no choice. And it did accelerate innovation, both in digital, but also just in how we do the work. And I think that's one thing that I take back. And Yoshi's right, those that had some kind of a foundational platform were able to do this more successfully. So always having a strategy in place and your foundation strong is gonna be important. We partnered with a, another a research organization to do a work at home study with, um, with over 4,000 agents and asked them well, what went well and what didn't go well. And the top four reasons, what they were disappointed or frustrated about had to do with technology. And that was in the very early days of this. And what happened was organizations had to solve those problems quickly. So collaboration tools, right? A VPN, securing the interactions and the internet uh, interactions, et cetera. So those were very important. But the other thing that they told us was once those were solved, what about me as a human? I, I'm disenfranchised. I, I don't get to talk to my friends at work anymore. I, I don't have that social outlet which work provides, but also how do I interact with my supervisor now? How do I get help? And those were the second stage of things that organizations had to solve for. So you have to, my talk about the little, you have to care for that whole ecosystem. Technology enables it, but all the people in process stuff is, I think is, is following quickly behind that. And we're seeing improvements in that. The other thing is the digital world that Yossi mentioned, which is, gosh, people now are now willing to self-serve. They're now willing to spend a little time in your IVR to get the help they need. And also, by the way, they want to be able to talk to you anytime, anywhere. They want to book their appointment for their next doctor in the Starbucks line, let's be honest, or while they're driving through because nobody walks into Starbucks that much anymore. So I think that's 
really the other thing that's driven is how rapidly the technology has accelerated from a digital perspective. Um, so with that, I think the other thing is just how do we deploy those things quickly and successfully? And we have to keep design in mind. If you're going to digitize it or move to a different channel, make sure that experience is to your brand. And what the, the failures have been, have been people who didn't design well, went out with a new channel and ended up having to pull that back because it didn't generate a good experience. So I think the other thing is thoughtful design goes into the precursor as, as a proper deployment and a good customer experience and high adoption. Thank you very much for that, Ruth. Um, and then I'll, uh, uh, Charlie, uh, if you could give us your thoughts um, around around this as well. Yeah, no, uh, thank you uh, again for having having me and uh, appreciate the forum. You know, you couldn't look at 2020 and say that, that it didn't accelerate uh, a lot of uh, uh, technologies, a lot of processes, a lot of you know, there, it's just a tremendously innovative time. Again, don't downplay the, the situation, but but it, it really forced, you know, I've been in healthcare for 20 plus years um, and never seen such rapid change and, and rapid change, not just in, in technology, but in every aspect of, you know, the hospitals, the, the, the clinics, the, you know, just about every, every space in healthcare. I mean, look, we, we, we went into March and, and April of last year and, and you know, we're talking to our, our hospital clients and, and clinic clients and, you know, and, and they're all saying the same thing. We're, you know, our waiting rooms are empty uh, and what do we do? And, and, you know, everybody had been talking about the idea of, you know, telehealth and virtual visits, remote patient monitoring, all that kind of stuff. And in healthcare, as we know, lags, the, uh, lags other industries in terms of speed to to change, uh, but it was amazing to watch how quickly, uh, quickly the, the change did occur, and and I think it was important, you know, for us to be able to to look at, at uh, you know at, at, at other alternative you know uh, uh, resources. I mean, we you know the speed to which virtual visits uh, went into play, the the need for scheduling, all that stuff made us really start to look at how do we outsource. And, 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 you know, for, for ourselves and our clients and, and, you know, and how do we be able to, you know, how, what's the best way to be able to scale? And, and so, you know, it was a, it was a very interesting time. We, we, we had to turn uh, very quickly to, you know, uh, you know, from, from, you know, post-discharge uh, patient follow-up to, to telehealth and, and remote patient monitoring, you know, there were, uh, needs for for our hospital clients, needs for our you know our our, our uh, clinic based clients, and and they were pretty much all the same. I would say that it was uh, all in all, it was amazing to me to watch how fast you know uh, the the this all accelerated, and 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 the need for which you know to use uh, you know technology in the beginning, and and now technology as we're we're kind of coming out of the other end, fortunately of this and we're looking at, you know, not only, you know, how do we fill up your virtual patient clinic uh, when patients were scared to go in and, and rightfully so, and, and providers were, you know, unable to, to invite them in, you know, to now on the other side, how do we re-enter the, the, the world of healthcare safely? And so, you know, that's, that, that uh, you know, gave us the opportunity as talent to really uh, look at how we use our technology as not just a virtual patient clinic or, uh, you know, a virtual uh, communication platform, but how do we use the same technology to be able to, to you know, put up uh, the thermal scanners at the entry and exit points of hospitals and, and use our, our, our app, the Talent View app, to really uh, to, to help, uh, you know, these, these, these hospitals as they reopen. Uh, yeah. I was on a webinar the other day and uh, with a, a big hospital up in New York, Montefiore, and they were talking about, you know, losing, you know, Delta Airlines levels of money every day. And, and the big, big question was, how, how do we begin to, 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 to open up safely? And so yeah. really a big, a big transformation on the front end. And, and now as we're coming out of the back end, 
And, and you know, the, the, the last thing I'll say is that I think it's not just amazing how quickly everybody reacted, but what a lasting impact this will have. You know, the, the, the term Zoom has, yeah. has, has, has Googled itself, right? I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, it's now on everybody's mind from your grandmother to, to, your, you know, to your youngest kids. And, and they're learning that way. They're visiting patients that way or visiting with, uh, you know, providers and teachers and everybody. So, you know, what, I, what I'm most excited about, I think, is the innovation and the hard work that went in during the pandemic and, and the lasting effect that it's going to have on, on healthcare and how it propelled us to, to jump ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Charlie. I have to say that I don't think uh, anyone's worked as fast um, when it comes to tech in 2020 than any other year. I mean, in my 35 years in this business, I've never seen, um, you know, IT move faster um, just all around. So um, I'm going to pose the same question to Mike. Mike, can you um, share some thoughts on this? Uh, yes. Uh, 2020, as we've all uh, been discussing, was a very challenging year on a lot of fronts. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that we learned out of that was that we always felt the technology was there. We've been 100% cloud-based for years as of our partners like Argo. So from that part, we felt totally safe and secure as well as competent in that area. The challenge was you had to force a change of behavior to the patient side. And I think what the pandemic did is it finally flipped that equation. And now the patients are more adoptive, if you will, of new technology. And really, they changed the definition of care from our perspective, uh, because before you could define care as I'm going to make a doctor's appointment, I'm going to go into an office. And now it's like I have elderly parents and but just to get them to be able to use their phone successfully is a challenge. But now that they've learned how to communicate with their provider uh, through video, through text, through chat uh, and email, they become much more um, demanding that that's the way they want to be dealt with in the future. So they realize that they don't have to go to the doctor's office to get visits. Now, the challenge is how do you get the information uh, in front of the person that's providing the care at the time or addressing the patient successfully so that they can have a nice, uh, productive conversation. And I think there's a lot of tools out there that people weren't probably that familiar with that now because of the pandemic, they've had to adopt some of those technologies uh, that put them more up into the cloud you don't have to abandon all of your systems. You just have to figure out how to enable them up there. And then also to be able to provide that information and access to the information uh, to the person that's using it. Uh, the other thing is, I think from a technologist perspective, we always look at, historically we've looked at technology, how can we reduce the burden on the human interaction? And I think what we've learned through the pandemic is there's safety in dealing with somebody in a live environment it's just that mode of communication might have changed. So rather than focus on how do we eliminate a human or eliminate interaction, let's make it really easy for our patients to have access to their information, do what they wanna do from a self-service perspective. But when they do want to engage, we need to be able to engage them the way they want to engage us. And then we need to be able to, to chain together all the different types of inputs that we have received, whether it was from an email, a chat session, voice, video, you name whatever mode of communication they use to contact you, you have to be able to chain all of those together and put it in front of the person that is contacting or dealing with a live engagement so that they can answer somebody without having to have them repeat themselves. So that's a very frustrating um, customer experience. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Um, and then I wanna ask Brandon, Brandon, um, you're, you're the one that's having to do all these things, right? Things that people are asking for um, all at the same time and, um, you know, being able to prioritize things and kind of do things that you probably never thought of doing before. So I wanted to get your perspective on, on what your life's been um, so far and, and, and how do you see 2020 uh, affecting tech uh, as, it re as it relates to customer service? Yeah, thanks, Lewis. Um, I don't think there's there's much left to really kind of 
quote unquote, uh, bring up or talk about as far as challenges. I think uh, Yossi, Ruth, Charlie, and, and, and Michael really, really brought that in um, from the person in, in the IT that, that has to, to make it all happen. Um, you know, if we are, uh, if we could think of, you know, the, the old Fast and Furious movie as being the IT, that's really what we were, right? How, how do we, how do we put it all together and be safe while we're doing it? Um, you know, having to react so quickly and, and having good partners was, was really, really beneficial. Um, I think from our perspective, being in the cloud and having agents at home originally, you know, set us up um, in a much better position to know what we were going into. Uh, Ruth brought up the challenge of, of moving so many people at home so very quickly. Um, we were very lucky in the fact that we had a, a, a dynamic living in the Northeast, right? Um, having people at home, having a process to get them there. Um, for us, it was really just driving it much, much faster than we had ever done before. Um, having good partners, having the information together like Singlecom, um, like Skycom, being able to work together uh, was extremely beneficial. Um, being able to take those pieces and then apply them and put them together very quickly um, left us uh, in a little bit better position than it did some other people. Um, I think that, you know, as we talk about the technology, as we talk about the customers um, and, and the patients, et cetera, um, being able to move into that position, um, it was very beneficial to be able to give them, as, as Michael was, was mentioning, um, how do they want that communication to happen, right? And that's really where, where 2020 began to, to move forward was how do we all come together as partners and, and provide a very holistic um, approach uh, for the patient and, and the experience um, to be able to, to really move forward? So I think that's, a, that's really where we were at. Um, it challenge-wise um, was really just making sure we were doing it correctly, right? We had to move quickly. Um, you know, there was times that maybe we didn't get to test the way that we wanted to. Um, but, you know, it was, it was being able to, to have your eyes on it, working together as partners and making sure that if what something was identified, we were jumping on and, and, you know, fixing it. And it didn't matter whether it was, you know, two o'clock in the morning or whether it was, you know, during working hours, right? You had to have your eyes on it and you had to be there to make sure that we were supporting, you know, those, those practices and hospitals that were out there. Good, um, good. Very good, Brandon. Thank you very much um, for that. I, I um, um, it kind of leads me into the second question for the panel, which is of the things that you have developed and the innovation that you were, um, you know, a big part of, um, what were the, what were the tools or could be one tool or maybe a couple of tools that were most impactful to um, not just the client, but to the patient as well, right? Um, if you could share some of that as well. Sure, absolutely. I, I don't think in particular there was one particular tool um, that, that, that came out. I think really what happened and what made it beneficial for the patient experience was we all as, as individual providers came together and said, you know what, how, how can we partner together uh, to work for the, the practices, to work for the, the patients and, and bring a, a holistic approach together, right? And that's, that's Yossi coming in and, and providing some self-service. That's Ruth stepping up and coming forward and partnering with us and saying, hey, let's map that that patient journey and, and see how everything comes together. That's mm -hmm. Mike and Singlecom on our back end providing us with the tools that we need for the contact center. That's mm -hmm. Charlie coming in and having the connections with the telehealth to, to the ERMs and putting everything together. And all of us really working and saying, hey, we're going to put everything that we have together. We're going to give a centralized reporting access. We're going to give a holistic approach. And we're going to give the patient the option of how do they want to communicate with us and how do they want to schedule everything? And I think that's really how, you know, 2020 impacted what 2021 is going to look like and how we're going to be able to provide a better experience, not only for the patient, but also for the practices in communication with the patient um, and, and their experience through registering for a new visit all the way through to, to post um, post care. Good. Excellent. Thanks for that information. Yossi, I want to ask you the same question um, on your end. What was the, the, you know, the most impactful innovation um, or tech, tech that you were involved in in 2020 leading into 2021 that really you know, was most impactful, again, for customer service? I think it is really all about the digital patient engagement and how can we provide that self-service personalization ease of use for the patients to engage with the healthcare provider. And I, I would you know, almost characterize it as the consumerization 
of healthcare. We we provide solutions also for other verticals, not only healthcare, and we're we're actually adopting other processes, other technologies from retail and e-commerce, from insurance, from fintech, and adapting it to the healthcare uh, to the healthcare uh, customers. And when you think about it from that perspective, and when uh, then then you're really providing them with the user journey, with a digital user journey with easy to use touch points and, and really simple uh, technology that is very useful for them. And for example, I had a, a conversation with one of our customers last week and we are currently building a self-service on-demand app for them with, uh, with timely reminders for before a, a colonoscopy, it's for a gastroenterology department. Mm -hmm. So I, and when they provided us all the information, I told them you need to think from the end user's point of view. So we also need to guide them to really handle their patients as consumers and build, we're building currently this on-demand app for them in a way that is very, very easy to use. So, you know, what we're taking from all of this is really looking at, at the patients as consumers. And it also touches one other point that I think Charlie mentioned before is that they are, they are also trying to get, get back to normality. There, there was, you know, uh, elective services were, were almost completely stalled during 2020. And this is a major both healthcare issue and a revenue generating issue. And we're helping some of our customer by reminding people, by educating people about the importance of, uh, for example, some of the elective services, whether it's colonoscopy, uh, breast cancer screenings and so on. So pushing out those reminders, pushing out those educational videos, helping them uh, using self-service to schedule appointments. All of that is part of the back to normality and, and getting that digital patient engagement. Hey, thank you very much, Yosef. Yeah, I uh, being a consumer of healthcare for many, many years myself, I totally understand what you were speaking about as, as it relates to colonoscopies. I mean, I, I need to have one every, every three or four years. And I understand that patient consumerism started probably somewhere around seven or eight years ago. And, you know, due to COVID, um, it, it basically went from first gear into fifth gear. So um, I'm glad yes. to, um, to hear, um, hear your notes on that. Charlie, if you could uh, give us your, your insights here as far as, you know, if there's one or, or several, um, you know, in, innovations um, that, you, that you can speak about that, that were most impactful for your organization. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I, what, one of the things, you know, look, what happened in 2020, uh, again, forced a lot of technology advances that, that have, have done unbelievable things for, for healthcare, for really every industry, but but for healthcare in particular, I think one, you know, the, the, you know, it really helped us shape our, our direction uh, as a remote, you know, we've always been a remote care management company, uh, but, but really, you know, having uh, reinforced the idea that, that, you know, patients are technologically savvy, right? There are, you can Google this, there are more, more smart devices in this country than there are toothbrushes, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's an amazing uh, uh, time that we live in from a technology perspective. So I guess, you know, in, in hindsight and looking forward, I guess one of the most amazing things is, you know, that, that, you know, uh, that the patients are capable of, uh, of, of a lot more than we ever gave them credit for. Uh, and, and, and they're now expecting it. And so, you know, when it comes to telehealth, the remote patient monitoring, using technology, uh, in, 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 a, in spaces where they, they didn't before. I mean, our average daily life uh, in, in, you know, outside of healthcare is a lot different than it was inside of healthcare. I mean, we use Uber to get around. We, you know, we order food with Uber. We, we watch Netflix on demand. We, we all this, but somehow we still wait in, in a waiting room with a clipboard and, and, and a piece of paper and a pencil, and we fill out the same information, whether we're in one clinic or another. Uh, that's those days may be gone, and uh, I think the expectation of efficiency and 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 I think uh, yes, you may have mentioned it. Somebody mentioned the, the consumerism of healthcare. I, I have a choice now where I'm going to go, and and 
you know, am I going to go somewhere that's efficient? Um, and is it, you know, where I, where I can, you know, do as much online as I possibly can, or am I going to go sit in the waiting room with a clipboard and a piece of paper and a pencil? Well, that, that's, 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 that's changing. And so, you know, I think, so technology, the, the ability of the patient, the expectation of the patient ha has all changed in, in 2020 and, and, and caught up with the rest of your life, right? And, you know, the, the Uber and the, the Netflix and, 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 you know, all that has now, now catching up with, with uh, healthcare. So I guess, you know, really understanding patients, uh, how they want to communicate, having the ability to have a omni-channel communication platform uh, and, and, and to, you know, deal with the patient where they want to be dealt with you know, was, was big. And, and so, you know, th those were two things. One, the technology and the ability of the patient uh, and the need for, for again, safe re-entry and, and opening up, not just clinics and hospitals for the purpose of, of treating uh, patients, but really, uh, you know, uh, reopening their revenue cycle, right? I mean, those are things that it's good and great to, to, to have great care, but if, if you can't get the patients back in, so, so I think, you know, safe re-entry is going to be huge. We, you know, it, it was amazing to me that our company was able to spin, spin up a, a, a COVID-19 uh, contact tracing uh, application along with the, the hardware at entry and exit points. And I, quite frankly, I, I questioned it in the beginning because I thought, wow, isn't this just a temporary situation? And, and somebody quickly reminded me of the TSA uh, and how that, that, that is the new normal, right? Whether it's, COVID or the flu or whatever version we have next, you know, we got to be ready for, for dealing with, with, uh, with the, you know, pandemics or, or, or just the flu. So I think uh, those are two big things I got left with um, over, over this, this 2020 thing. Good, good. You know, you mentioned a, a, an, an interesting word and that was expectations. I think there, there's a level of expectation now that really probably didn't really exist before, or it was basically toleration. I think a lot of patients just tolerated. Um, and we've always seen some, you know, the advances in healthcare on the clinical side, but not on the business of healthcare, right? Or which is, you know, anything involved to involved in patient access or patient accounting. So Ruth, if you could give us kind of your, um, you know, your insights here, as far as what was most impactful from a, from a tech customer service perspective. Yeah, taking a broad look at this from an industry perspective, uh, NTT has been doing a customer experience benchmark study for over 20 years now. And in our latest study in 2020, we asked this question. And the responses that came back from over a thousand people really were um, digital, automation, which includes AI and personalization, right? And in order to do all three of those things, we've got to have the data managed in, in smart ways, good hygiene, know where it is, how to get to it. And so those were the really the key themes. And when you think about that, you also then have to think about that means I'm increasing my channels. Today, most companies are using about eight channels. That's expected to rise to 11 before the end of this year. Now that means we have even more information and people have been mentioning connecting those journeys and, and harmonizing those, that's critical. And that's where we go back to making sure we're designing them correctly. Um, so one of the things that we like to do is just step back and say, hey, what is the customer's journey? We do a lot of journey mapping with our clients. And in doing that, we find out what's working, what's not, where the hotspots are, and where are the opportunities. The other thing is making sure we meet our customers, who they are and where they are. Demographically, what the study also showed us is that people in different age groups want to participate in different channels. This will not surprise anyone. If you're over 55, you still like the phone. Go figure, but there's a whole group of people. And in healthcare, we deal with a lot of folks that are over 55 and 65. Then you've got the millennials who are saying, I don't care if I ever talk to anyone, automate this, please. So when you were talking about expectations, you can't just care for one set of expectations. But what journey mapping has taught us, if nothing else, is that you have to care for four or five different personas or sets of expectations. And I think that's gonna be one of the key challenges. Let's think smartly about designing those so we get high adoption when we do innovate. The other is just automation and artificial intelligence. So Gartner predicts, this is their latest study, there will be 23 billion with a B 
internet connected devices by 2022, which is like right around the corner. So what you're really saying is that's more channels, that's more touch points, that's more innovation. It's gonna be required by everyone um, in this industry and, and other industries, as Josie mentioned, because we can learn a lot from others. Um, so that's, that's gonna mean is that we've gotta get smart about making sure that, that we can automate and use that. So right now, most people are using rules-based bots, right? I give the bot a set of rules, someone calls in, the bot knows how to push a piece of information out to them or push the workflow along in the back office. But that's changing very rapidly. The bot's gonna get smarter. And what we've gotta figure out is what do we want the bot to do and how do we make sure the bot still delivers a human experience, which brings us to personalization, right? We want, when we call in, oftentimes the IVR or the bot can say, you know, hello, Yoshi. I see that you have an appointment with us on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, is that what you're calling about? Yoshi can say, yes, bam, we immediately self-serve Yoshi. Did you wanna change that appointment, right? That's smart and that's being done today, but all the way in through when Yoshi says, no, I have a question about, then it's smart enough to route Yoshi immediately to someone who can help him, the right person with the right skills that can answer that, whether it's a clinical or non-clinical question. So you begin to see how we immediately impact the customer experiences if we get smart around designing, understanding and designing those experiences, and then begin to personalize them. Every client we talk to in every industry wants to know how can I make sure that Michael and Yoshi and Brendan get exactly the experience they expect and that they want. And maybe I'm able to even surprise them and delight them with something they didn't expect because now I can give them next best action. This is what you should be doing with this protocol. And we get the AI smarts behind the bots or whatever we're using, even the humans to make help our clients and customers and patients to make better decisions about their care. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I wanted to also um, uh, talk about really quickly, um, you know, I was talking with my team today on how easy it is for me to go um, to call my bank through, an IV, through their IVR and get my account balance without speaking to an agent, but we um, don't have that technology. We still need to uh, have an agent speak to the customer to give them their account balance. And it's almost like, you know, I should be able to do the same. I should be able to, through, through my IVR system, um, give the patient the ability to check their account balance. And if they want, let's say, uh, to know what insurance was billed primary and which one was billed secondary, I should be able to do that through the IVR instead of, a, you know, having an agent do that, right? I mean, these are things that we're seeing, you know, uh, uh, within the, you know, general you know, world of things, right? When we talk to banks and, uh, 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 you know, Amazons and so on and so forth. However, you know, with healthcare, um, it's not there yet, but could be 2020 COVID could be a blessing in disguise for patient or for consumerism of healthcare. So really interesting, really interesting your thoughts. Um, yeah, and just one other comment on that. We, what we see with a lot of healthcare organizations, especially the, the more sophisticated ones is they're pulling all that data together to do exactly what we're talking about. So they have to get the electronic health records harmonized with whatever patient experience, you know, other technology right. to have their billing systems, right? Or their scheduling systems. All those are living in silos right now. If we can just pull all that together and connect it, now we've got something we can really work with. So we can give the answer to the question about which was billed primary and secondary, or was it, you know, how do I solve a, you know, we know billing questions are a high driver of, of calls into, into the facilities as well. So we can get smart yeah. about that. Yeah, the, those two questions that I posted about account balance and what, what insurance was built in my account are the two top uh, dispositions, call dispositions that, you know, that I'm seeing right now. Um, great. So I think we've got some poll questions for everyone. And I, I wanted to um, uh, uh, pivot over to Mike. Mike, uh, you've got access to those poll questions. And uh, if you could uh, do us a favor and uh, share the poll questions with the, with the group. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, during the course of Lewis, while you're facilitating otherwise, uh, Trisha was good enough to push out those questions uh, to our participants and okay. being able to, to run that together. So uh, the first poll question that we shared out, especially looking in arrears at 2020, uh, was what do you find most demanding, challenging uh, to manage 
uh, through 2020, and uh, and it could have been a stack rank or select, uh, and it was you know determining whether it's conversion conversion from working in center to work at home, uh, compliancy, and being able to meet that uh, through the course of all these changes in heavy demand, uh, platforms, telephony, uh, learning not ready, uh, learning systems not ready or suitable for work at home environments. Uh, and the last one was workflows and processes that needed to be redeveloped in order to be uh, to meet the, the demands as, as well as the compliancy that are essential. So um, it'll be interesting to see what we've got coming back from that. Uh, Tricia, I'll, I'll invite uh, if this is something that we'll be sending out just in follow up uh, or whether we do have uh, kind of kind of a stack ranking of what we've gotten back uh, to date. Yeah, so I can pull up and share what those results look like. Um, we still have the the second question up um, in a, a couple of minutes if, if folks want to respond to that one before I pivot over to response to the first. Good. Why don't, why don't we, I'll go ahead and just cover the second then, and then we can show the results from each. And Perfect. then we did have a question come in on Q&A as well, and I want to make sure that we've got an opportunity uh, to be able to get to that as well. Uh, so the second poll question that we had, uh, which is looking into 2021, are what are, are the top uh, customer experience technology and innovation developments that may be most impactful to healthcare CX in 2021? Now, it's, a, it's a broad question, uh, but we, we at least gave four uh, areas to be able to uh, select highest priority. And the first one was uh, more adaptable and comprehensive platforms for patient communication. Uh, we've got some good experience on this panel with that today. Uh, need for update to core EHR, and we know many of our clients today are wrestling with that as, as, as a critical one. Um, the third is displacing old redundant uh, architecture and simplified cloud-based solutions. And the fourth is leveraging contact center and technology partners uh, for expertise and resources. And I think that fourth one comes back to a, a core theme that, that's been echoing, I think, from uh, a lot of our participants and, and a lot of the folks on the panel uh, is, is that there isn't a need to go it alone. Uh, so uh, being able to, to select that and we invite our participants to be able to you know, uh, make a selection at this time uh, and then we'll be able to share back uh, what those net results were. And then Tricia, as, as you have a chance to tabulate that, you know, I'll go ahead and invite um, you know, the panel. Uh, and, and Charlie, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to kick this one off. Um, you know, Cynthia Zanikova sent over a, a question for us and she actually rephrased it a little bit, uh, stating I'm wanting to know how provider adoption is helping to drive acceptance of patient utilization uh, for telehealth platforms. So she took it into a much more concise uh, area. And, and Charlie, I know with your uh, platform specialized in this area, maybe you can kind of kick off uh, a little bit of a response there. Yeah, that's, you know what, that's a great question, Cynthia. And, and the, the reality was, uh, again, not to go back, uh, you know, and rehash the, the fact that the rest of our lives in general, <laughs> uh, outside of healthcare have been, you know, have been pretty advanced. I mean, again, you, you, hey, Siri, what's what's the weather going to be like today? Uh, or, or gosh, it's listening to me, but or uh, Amazon listening device, what is what is uh, what's the weather going to be like today? What's, you know, uh, grabbing a Uber to work or, you know, ordering food to be taken out? You know, I think I think a, a lot of, uh, you know, our life was driven by, uh, you know, the the experience and the ease of experience and and again when it came to healthcare you know and and telehealth and remote patient monitoring you know uh, uh, you know virtual visits you know when it comes to healthcare we rely so heavily on on the suggestion of our of our of our provider doctor nurse whoever it is you know it's you know we put a different or at least i, I my experiences a, a different emphasis is put on their their reaction their suggestion than in any other aspect of our life because if the doctor says take this you're going to take that if the doctor says go get this test you're going to take that test you know uh and 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 so to to cynthia's question you know it was you know it was 
it was need, I think, that pushed the provider to, to, um, to really push telehealth and remote patient monitoring and, and, and virtual visits. So, um, you know, they, they opened their door, they looked out and they said, boy, our, 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 you know, our, our waiting room's empty. You know, what are we going to do? And, and, you know, we, we were seeing patients every 15 minutes uh, all day long, and now those patients can't come in and won't come in. And so there was a need very quickly to shift to telehealth, remote patient monitoring uh, to stay uh, to stay alive and to to keep the doors open. So it was that need that drove the providers to to drive the patients. And so I think that we saw you know just uh, you know the tremendous adoption rates. I know with with our platform we we've really built sort of a virtual patient clinic, right? So it's not just telehealth or virtual visits, or it's, it's the ability to, to monitor devices. Ruth, to your point, you know, the number of devices that we're adding to, 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 to our hub, if you will, is growing every day. I mean, we, we just met with a company called Stratus Labs. They've built a, a wearable device that listens to your lungs and, and connects via Bluetooth back to our platform. So patients with COPD that are having distress long in advance. And it uses a lot of AI to, to process that data uh, to say, hey, this patient is, is going down a path of distress. And, and we know with COPD patients, their likelihood to readmit uh, to a hospital is high. Same with you know, CHF, con congestive heart failure, or diabetes, sepsis. You know, a lot of these, these top um, conditions have really work together to, to, you know, with technology uh, and, and data and AI to help, to help drive what both the providers are doing and what the patients are doing. I, you know, you've got companies like CardioMems and all these, these great high-tech companies that are, that are, you know, creating wearable devices that, that you know, are, 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 are able to monitor patients on a, on a real-time basis. And so I think that the need for the, the, the provider to get, you know, to, 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 to advance their, their thought around, uh, you know, remote patient monitoring, remote care management really uh, has, has driven the patient's compliance. And, and again, you know, if, if the doctor says do it, there, there's a high likelihood that the patient's gonna do it. And, and if the doctors now need to do it, and they, 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 it's really helping drive the, the, the patient to do it. So, you know, it was, uh, again, it was, it was, you know, 2020 did a, a lot of, uh, a lot of things, but I think when it came to, you know, patient adoption to, to virtual visits, to telehealth, you know, that, that may have been driven partially by patient need, but a lot by provider uh, you know, they need it, you know, CMS, the Medicare, Medicaid, you know, the, the federal government really changed the rules when it came to, to remote patient care. They said, hey, look, we know patients can't come in. So instead of billing a 99213 office visit CPT code, let's add a telehealth modifier and do that from home because we still need to get our eyes on the patient. We still need to see it. And, and again, another quick way that the that our, 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 the federal government responded in saying, hey, we're gonna pay for these visits, even if they're from home. And so there were a lot of things that really went into to driving this, but, but at the core, it was, you know, it's, it is to Cynthia's question and comment, it, it, was, it was the provider uh, and, and a need all the way around. Yeah, Charlie, I, I appreciate that response, and and frankly, I appreciate Cynthia's you know uh, note that the provider had been part of the holdback uh, prior, and you know so much of that goes to you know the compliance um, in in some degrees, you know, and and some of it was driven state by state, right, and uh, and some of it was comfort in being able to, to for for the providers that have been operating within a certain paradigm uh, and compliancy. Uh, to be comfortable to move into new technology and and new forms and new communication, um, and not to have that training. Uh, AMA just released some new stuff about you know that the necessity and the process that's being pushed now uh, for providers to be trained to adopt the, the technology 
uh, essential for telehealth, essential for remote patient monitoring, right? And and the coaching that comes along with that. You know, those, these are some of the things from the people process technology that all of us collectively on this panel uh, have been putting together as solutions and implementing into market. But it's no longer just that the technology exists. Uh, it's the necessity of this past year that really pushed that forward. And, and I think, you know, seeing that and, and the, uh, the coming down of some of those regulatory walls state by state, now north of 40 states have changed uh, their regulatory and compliance CMS, you know, led the way uh, in, in a lot of the things, you know, a, a year ago. Uh, so really being able to see some of those things come about. Uh, the next is going to be now, uh, how do traditional med schools uh, begin to help uh, train that, that next set of uh, clinicians that are coming forward to be comfortable with technology and how that's going to apply well. Uh, and I think that's going to be a next step in the evolution of where we go here. So there's also I'll like on the panel, that, any that, other comments that, on, on yeah. that question, Yossi? Yeah, I want to say that it's it's on the provider side, but it's also the, uh, the acceptance of the patients to absorb and to utilize all of these new digital uh, solutions. And and it's also, it's not only by the millennials, it's also by the older population. And uh, we're providing, for example, a digital survey after appointments, uh, you know, with the doctors and the other healthcare providers. And, and we see that 42% of the responses are actually coming from people that are 61 years and older. 42% of the responses are coming from that age group. And actually 68% are coming from 50 years and above. So it's not only this older population that we were all afraid of providing those digital solutions are actually using it much more and, and have accelerated the usage of the digital platforms during the last uh, year. Struggling with my mute button. Yeah, great, great point there, Yosef. Uh, and and that, that, that adoption now all the way around and how that's moving. So as we look through 2021, I think it's going to be a bellwether year, uh, frankly, from, from uh, you know, how regulatory applies. Um, and as regulatory has been, been you know, forced now uh, to make changes, uh, how providers have been forced now in order to be able to meet uh, the healthcare demand. Uh, and then to your point, Yossi, is, is frankly, you know, as the consumers of, of, of healthcare, uh, you know, across the board, um, we're not just seeing it in younger generations that are tech savvy, uh, but frankly, uh, across the board, as we get older, we become greater consumers and, uh, and being able to recognize that other industries, uh, whether, whether it's our entertainment, whether it's our banking, you know, and, and financial uh, accesses um, that, uh, you know, older consumers, frankly, have been, you know, trained and adopted in other things. So it's not going to be a trade-off of a lot of this, this experience. It's going to be more um, when, where, and how, you know, uh, these consumers of healthcare want to be met and, uh, and with regulatory having to adapt to some of that. So any other comments there? All right, I'm, I'm going to invite Tricia, if we've got some net results that we might be able to share uh, across from some of our panelists on uh, our poll questions. Uh, let's go ahead and put that out there. Okay, and and the first one is, uh, what did you find was most demanding, challenging? Uh, looking at arrears at 2020, uh, the top uh, result was the conversion from work in center to work at home, and uh, and and not a not a surprise there so much that you're talking about changing over of workforce and and location and technology and being able to meet that compliance you know, on, on the next uh, as, as being a, a key area of, of 31%. Um, you know, while, while lower compliance was still one of those critical factors that uh, compliance didn't go away. Uh, there, there might've been a little laxing of rules right down to docs doing Zoom calls like we're doing you know, right now, right? Before becoming fully compliant back on platforms. Uh, but at the same time, compliance didn't go away. And, and so being able to adapt to that. Uh, the high performer here was clearly the platforms telephony uh, and, and learning systems not ready or suitable for work at home environments. Um, and, uh, and so that adoption alone uh, and, and a lot of our panelists here being able to, to accommodate with those platforms uh, in that good knowledge base that needs to come in there. 
uh, were essential. Um, that one's not over yet, uh, but the technology exists there. And, and really now it's going to be, you know, having those hard conversations, budgets, uh, et cetera, uh, to be able to get get over there. But I think also the, uh, uh, the way that a lot of uh, cost models exist today, we're not talking about, you know, forklift change outs of platforms in order to be able to get there. You know, cloud-based platforms that are very adaptable with price models that are very affordable uh, to be able to come into the mix, you know, make an awful lot of sense. It's having those those conversations with both operations and IT uh, within provider environments now to be able to make those changes over. Uh, and then lastly was, was workflows and processes need to be redeveloped. Uh, and while it came in lower along the way, perhaps as a priority, uh, we all know that we've all lived that uh, in being able to make sure that those workflows reflect that. Uh, Mike Puccinelli, I know your, your, your engine that you have driving right in that space uh, has been critical in order to be able to make a lot of those accommodations. So uh, any comments from the panel? Any surprises? Yeah, Mike, I want to also... Mike, I also also want to add that also redundancy has become something that is, um, um, uh, at least from my end, it, I'm seeing a lot more discussion around redundancy, and that, and what I'm referring to is, you know, geographic redundancy, where whereas a work from home environment sort of, I mean, for lack of a better word, makes it a little bit easier to create, you know, redundancy models, right? When you have people that are working from home as opposed to folks working in one center. Um, so um, that that's something that I, I just wanted to share with the rest of the group to see if maybe um, you know they're they're having similar discussions or or or, or something like that. Well, certainly I, I know that uh, collectively we've seen a, a lot more requests come out you know from from clients that in the healthcare space specifically around you know hey I'm you know my own internal center is down. Um, we can't come in. How can you help, right? And and looking to uh, outsource services providers, which we all represent in various forms, you know, people, process, and technology. Uh, how can we help, right? So having partners in that space uh, really has become an essential request. Uh, and better technology that might be more cloud-based and routable and and uh, and and uh, and playable in in a much more rapid sense uh, is certainly Absolutely. there, right? It's absolutely, absolutely good. Yeah, it's all about business. Yeah, it's all about business continuity. So, <clears throat> good. And Trisha's put up our, our next one there, which is uh, you know our, our question two, looking at, at 2021. Uh, what are some of the top uh, customer experience technologies and innovations that we think will be most helpful or impactful in the healthcare space? Uh, so, you know, it's, it's funny, the first two uh, really did not get, you know, much response at all uh, be, between the adaptability uh, of comprehensive platforms or the need for, for a core EHR upgrade. Really, all of the answers really fell into the second set, which is displacing old redundant architecture with simplified, uh, simplified cloud-based solutions. Um, you know, if anybody's interested, I know a few folks on this panel might be happy to talk to you. Um, the, the second is really leveraging contact center and technology partners uh, for expertise and resource. And again, coming back to that theme of, you know, there's, there's no good reason to go it alone anymore. Um, having that good expertise uh, to, to bring a broader perspective, uh, to bring best practices uh, to mind, uh, to, to bring some of that redundancy that we were just talking, to, talking about uh, into the mix. Uh, makes great sense for for building those things in this year if if they hadn't been built in prior. Um, so I'll invite again comments from the panel. Uh, I've got something. Uh, so so one thing that was interesting on the two poll questions, I think you know at, at Argo and Singlecom, we take for granted uh, the uh, architecture up being up in the cloud, and it's ours is about as simple as it gets. Uh, but I think Ruth hit it spot on. You know, there's going to be all these inputs from every different type of device you can imagine. Mo a lot of people have a wearable that they wear now. If they don't, they'll be getting one. Everybody has a cell phone. But it's how you connect all of the disparate pieces of information together and either have proactive um, or, you know, some kind of outreach communication to a patient that's really going to set people apart as we go forward. So I, I, I was shocked on the first poll to see that uh, workflows were not a bigger 
um, vote getter because it seems to me that that's the biggest, I, I feel like everybody's going to be up in the cloud sooner rather than later, but it's how you use that information and how you address uh, both incoming inquiries or you know outgoing proactive outreach and use that information to provide some value to the patient without them having to reach out to you that's going to set people apart. So I think workflows are going to be something that is going to be um, a big driver going forward for satisfying customers. Yeah, the other thing I would add is, and I mentioned our benchmark study, and the other thing that when people said, what gets in the way of moving your technology and innovation forward, it's lack of resources that are skilled to do that. Most healthcare organizations don't have a data scientist on staff, right, to help you with what you're talking about, pulling all that data together. And most don't have a user interface designer on staff. So I think this is where you can find partners who have that particular skill and kind of surgically insert them to solve that problem, get the design and the, and the harmonization of the data. And then what you're talking about, Michael, is then you can connect those channels, pull all that data and make smart decisions. Not So it's predictive. We want to get to the point of being predictive about what can and should happen next. And that pulls the customer through that experience in a significantly better way, I think. Excellent point. Now, I think that's and I'm sorry, was there another comment? No, I, I think I was just going to agree with both Mike and Ruth on that point where in 2020, we saw, you know, everybody having those challenges with their systems, with their telephony, with their platforms, because they weren't prepared to, to head into, you know, the at home kind of virtual environment, right? So now that we're there, to Ruth's point, now in, in Mike's point, we're going to start to see those workflows and, and become more adaptive and how they all come together. And I think it just kind of brings back to the point where you know, I think we've all hit on it. Right, that don't go it alone. Right, we're all here, and we all partner together to provide that that holistic approach and, and give everybody the workflows and experiences that that they want heading into twenty twenty one and and beyond. Now, great great note, Brandon. Thanks for the contribution. Uh, I I think for for all of us now, as we're we're rolling into you know the final minute here, is uh, is is just recognizing that um, as as we look at healthcare. Uh, in 2021, uh, we were pushed forward uh, significantly uh, last year. So much of, the, of this technology pre-existed, uh, but there hadn't been the impetus or the force or the kick uh, right up to regulatory that, that may have been restricting much of that as well. Uh, we were forced into this, uh, but it's an area that other industries have gone ahead. Uh, so now being able to take some of those best practices that have existed where the consumerization of healthcare um, we as consumers are more ready for this in that, that adoption. Uh, so as providers or, or as, as healthcare payers uh, out there in, in a lot of our uh, participants and audience as well uh, are looking at things, it's a, it's a brave new world, but it's not one that healthcare is venturing into uh, you know, without some, some precursors going ahead from other industries. So we've got technology that exists uh, from much of this panel as well. We've got uh, data scientists that, that exist uh, and, and are ready to jump in and help and are already so doing so in so many regards uh, so that we can do things, you know, better, smarter, meeting our, our consumer demand, you know, when, where, and how they want to be met uh, and helping a lot of these providers uh, adopt over uh, more quickly. And how can we simplify their architecture in order to be able to do so? So I, I think this has been a great panel for us to bring this forward. Uh, we do have a, uh, a, another series coming up next month, uh, also on the 24th, as we tie together, again, people, process, and technology. So we invite our participants, uh, you know, to come join us then. And we want to thank, thank this great panel, uh, you know, from Ruth, Yossi, Charlie, uh, Mike, Brandon, uh, Lewis, thank you for, for helping us uh, co-host today. Uh, but uh, wonderful discussion, and, and thanks very much for everyone for, uh, for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to our participants as well. Bye now.